Hi there, good morning everyone. We are officially going to start unit two of AP Microeconomics today, which is called supply and demand. And those are probably two terms that you maybe heard used together in the past, but maybe not necessarily in the context of economics. So this unit, supply and demand, is really an analysis and an assessment of our economic system here in the United States. So remember in unit one, we talked about the command economic system versus the market economic system, we in the United States, our economic structure is closer to that market-based economy, but it's not necessarily a free market, which doesn't really exist anywhere in the world. The government always has to have some type of intervention in specific markets, uh, but we are closer to a market-based economy than, say, China, much closer. And we still have very much a free market-based economy but not every single marketplace, meaning specific goods or services, is exactly free. And we'll talk about some of those examples. So we start by looking at supply and demand free in a perfectly competitive market, a perfect free market. Um, and then we start adding in little bits of government intervention, taxes, subsidies, things of that nature. And, and you probably saw some of those terms used in your unit one vocab, which if you didn't get that done, please do that vocab before you really dive into anything else so that you uh, have a full grasp of what we're talking about here in these lectures. So without further ado, supply and demand, let's take a look. All right, so unit two, supply and demand, equilibrium, disequilibrium, and the government. Let's take a look. So here are the list of sections that we're going to be looking at in unit two. Today we're only focusing on 2.1 and 2.2. We're sort of uh, setting the table, if you will, uh, for everything else that's going to come by just looking at supply and demand on their own today. So let's start with the demand side. The law of demand says that as the price in a market decreases, quantity demanded will increase and vice versa. If the price in the market increases, quantity demanded will decrease. In other words, there is this inverse relationship, decreases, increases, between the price in a market and the way that quantity demanded reacts or changes as a result of that price change. But notice, this is a, an order of operations issue. Okay, If price changes first, now we're dealing with the law of demand. But consider the opposite. Let's say the demand for something increases first, well, if demand goes up for something, wouldn't it make sense to increase the price of that good if you're the one selling it? Sure it would. So order of operations matters. Another thing that matters, when we say quantity demanded increases, that's different than just saying the demand. Okay, Quantity demanded is the specific quantity, one value that's demanded at a given price in the market, $3 and 20 units demanded, for example. But when we say demand, just demand, that is overall demand in the market. It's a much broader term. So let's look at demand on a graph. The graphs that you're going to be using, that we'll be using throughout this unit, and really uh, as we move forward most of the time, looks like this. You've got dollars on the y-axis. So this could be price. It could be cost. Um, it could be uh, benefit, right, uh, it, it, as measured in some dollar form. On the x-axis, we have Q. For quantity. So that's it. It's an x and y axis and basically we're going to match up those two variables. At any given price measured on the y axis there is a certain amount demanded by the market which is on our x axis. So with demand comes cost benefit analyses, right? There are trade-offs. We already know that. We looked at that in unit one. So what are those trade-offs for a consumer? The cost is the prices they must pay and the benefit would be their personal satisfaction, what we call marginal private benefit. That is the, the personal or private benefit that each individual experiences when they go to consume the, that good. Now, keep in mind, we talked about marginal analysis, right? A person is not going to pay more for something than what they're getting in terms of marginal private benefit. So that helps us determine where they fall on this graph. Now, let's actually start graphing. The first point on our graph is going to be on the y-axis here. At $70, it looks like nobody wants to consume this good. It's too expensive, but 
as soon as the price drops to $60, our first customer, Alex, is willing to jump into this market. So at $60, we have one quantity demanded, okay? So Alex is willing to pay $60 because their marginal private benefit is also $60. Wherever the individual consumer falls vertically on this graph, that is also showing us what their marginal private benefit is. It's their willingness to pay 60 bucks, but it's also their marginal private benefit because that's what they're willing to pay, right? When we drop the price to $50, we get another consumer and our QD is now at two. Blake decides to jump into this market. When that price drops to $50, Blake is sitting there and they're like, yep, my marginal private benefit for this good is 50, so as soon as it drops to 50 or below, that's a trigger for Blake to jump in and buy this good. When the price drops to $40, Corey jumps in because 40 is their marginal private benefit and their willingness to pay. 30, Devin jumps in. 20, Echo jumps in. So at a price of $20, remember, it's not just Echo, right? It's Echo plus all of these other individual consumers who are willing to pay at least $20. So the reason it's five and not just Echo, just one, is because we have to include Devin, Corey, Blake, and Alex, who are all willing to pay much more than $20. Now, you can see the definite trend occurring here, right? As price decreases, quantity increases. As, as price decreases, QD increases. Price decreases, QD increases. That's our law of demand. And it's going to continue all the way down until we get our demand curve. So our demand curve will normally be negatively sloped because of the, the process that you see taking place here. More consumers jump into the market as the price drops. But also, this is our marginal private benefit curve. Okay, marginal private benefit is the same as the demand curve because one is derived from the other. So that's a little bit of the demand side of things. Now, there are different things that can change, right? We might substitute a couple goods for one another. Our income might change. Let's talk about the substitution effect. The substitution effect essentially just says that as the price of one good changes, it changes how we view another good. So with substitutes, actual substitute goods, they replace one another. So let's go back to this graph. On this graph, as this price increases, they're going to lose Echo as a consumer. They're going to lose Devin. They're going to lose Corey. And, and they're not just going to put their money in their pocket. They're going to go buy something that's more affordable or more beneficial to them instead of buying this good, right? So the substitution effect is pretty powerful. The complementary effect falls within this, this larger realm, but complements go with one another, okay? So for example... If the price of peanut butter increases, we might see a drop in the demand for jelly because those are complements. Whereas with substitutes, if the price of Samsung phones increase, we might see an increase in demand for iPhones because as the one competitor gets more expensive, people might go to the replacement good, all right, and vice versa. So that's the substitution effect. It's the idea that a price change in one good can push us toward or away from another. Now, the income effect, the price of the good isn't changing at all, okay? Excuse me, it can change, it doesn't have to. So, so for example, as our income goes up, okay, even if prices are staying the same, demand is going to change because our real purchasing power is changing. Now, this is why I stopped myself a moment ago. Let's say that income isn't changing at all. If our income is staying the same, but the price of a good is changing, that's actually affecting our real income, isn't it? Because now we have the same amount of money to buy a lot of cheaper goods or more expensive goods. So the income effect in general as a whole is all about purchasing power. It's all about the real value of something versus the face value. Saying something costs $20 doesn't really mean much, 
unless you're given the income of that person, the budget that that person faces, all of those types of things. So there's two different types of goods we look at in uh, this realm, normal and inferior. A normal good, as income increases, demand also increases. So as we make more money, we buy more of it. As we make less money, we buy less of it. There is this direct relationship between income and demand. With an inferior good, it's an inverse relationship. As income goes up, we now demand less of this particular thing. Because now we have more purchasing power and we can buy normal goods, we don't have to consume inferior goods. That's the idea. We're, we're becoming richer and we demand less of that thing. It's kind of like saying, oh, we're too good for that. We don't have to buy that good anymore because it's inferior. All right, it's the opposite of a normal good. So those are some things that are happening within our market here, right? That's, those are things that uh, can push consumers out of a market or into a market. And we'll talk more about those things here in a moment. Demand incentives and constraints uh, are essentially like talking about production possibilities, right? But in this case, we're talking about consumption possibilities as well as, um, I suppose, some of the... Uh, uh, the benefits, the incentives as well, right? So it's not just um, constraints, it's also the benefits. We're looking at marginal private benefit. That's an incentive. An incentive for buying something as a consumer is that you experience some satisfaction. We don't know what that satisfaction is because it's so idiosyncratic. It's so personal. Um, and, and some of us are like, why would you spend money on that? That seems silly. And yet people do. So one incentive is just the private benefit that you get out of consuming that good. The other incentive might be something like decreased prices. The price goes down, it becomes more affordable, and that pulls us in. That's what sales are intended, intended to do. Some of the constraints we face are things like income, time, different laws and regulations that might limit what we're actually allowed to purchase. So we're, we're playing within this big system and we have these constraints, but we try to maximize our satisfaction. And we talked about that a little bit in unit one. Now, the market demand is just a, a summation, okay, of all of the individual consumers. So let's say we have three consumers in this particular market. There's Jordan, Braun, and Amir. Okay, Jordan... Um, at $20 demands zero units of this good. At 15, one. At 10, two. And at $5, Jordan demands six. Now, to get the market quantity demanded, all we would do is take Jordan's plus Bronze plus Amir's quantity demanded at that particular price. And that gives us market. So, at $20, Jordan, zero. Bronze, zero. Amir, one. So the market quantity demanded is one. At $15, Jordan's demand is two, Bronze demand is two, Amir's demand is four, so market QD is seven. So I just wanted to point out that these market demand schedules or market demand curves, right, the, the demand within an entire market at different prices, 20, 15, 10, and five, those are just summations of these individual consumers QDs added up at those different prices, okay? Uh, finally, we might see a situation where something like this can happen. For market demand, it can shift. And we started already talking about this a little bit with substitute goods, complementary goods, normal goods, inferior goods. These shifts must be caused by something other than the price in this market. Okay, these are outside factors affecting this market. So remember, if price changes in this market, that's already baked into our demand curve. That's already shown here. We know what price, price changes in the market look like because we just graphed it. So it has to be something outside of the market happening that could shift the entire demand curve. And, and watch what happens when this demand curve shifts. Before it does, we've got our nice handy dandy demand curve and our marginal private benefit curve and everything is really clean and nice. But as soon as that shift occurs, this is our new demand curve now. 
this is our new mar marginal private benefit curve. So essentially something happened, and we don't know what yet, it's a big mystery, something happened that caused every single individual consumer on this curve, all of our people, Devin and Corey and all of them, they now are all willing to pay a little bit more to get this good because their marginal private benefit for all of them increased a little bit and therefore demand increased. So check out what happens here now. Whereas at $70 before, zero consumers demanded this good, now after the shift at $70, demand, quantity demanded is three. So you can see instantly what this does to the market, right? People now demand more items at prices where, where before they didn't demand any at all. So these shifts can happen for a few different reasons. What, what causes this to happen? Everything you see in green, okay, in this green row on top here, okay, I shouldn't say everything you see in green, everything you see to the right of this big green increase shift right text would cause the demand curve to shift rightward. Everything you see to the right of this decrease text would cause the demand curve to shift downward. And so you can see the arrows here I've written upward, but really we just saw on the demand curve, it's actually a rightward shift because that would be quantity. People want more of this item. So what could cause that to happen? The price of a substitute could change. So let's say goods X and Y are substitute goods. Well, that'd be like iPhones and Samsungs, right? So if a Samsung price goes up, then the demand for iPhones will probably go up because they're competitors. And some people are going to think, well, I went to the store yesterday and today the price went up for a Galaxy, but the price of the iPhone stayed the same, so it actually looks better and that would increase demand or shift demand to the right. The opposite would be if the price of the Samsung Galaxies went down, now those iPhones look a little worse in comparison, don't they? Because even if the price didn't change, the Samsungs did. They're on sale and we might give it a second thought before we just buy the iPhone. So our demand for that iPhone might shift down a little bit. The same can be true of compliments. With compliments, if X and Y are complementary goods, then what can happen is we might actually see this inverse relationship. Let's say peanut butter and jelly. If the price of peanut butter goes down, the demand for jelly will go up. Because not only are we going to buy more peanut butter as the price goes down, but they're complementary goods, so we're going to buy more jelly too. And then the opposite would be true. Okay, If the price of peanut butter goes up, not only are we going to buy less peanut butter, but also less jelly. With income, if the, if the income of someone goes up and we're talking about a normal good, their demand will also go up for that good. If their income goes up but it's an inferior good, now demand will go down. Okay, Increased ad spending would increase demand. Decreased ad spending would decrease demand. Trends, taste, all that stuff, that, that's a little more obvious, but any of these things could cause these types of shifts to happen, rightward or leftward. So very quickly, let's, let's talk about supply. It's basically a rehash of what we just did. So the law of supply is just the opposite, right? As the price in a market decreases, quantity supplied will decrease. As the price in a market increases, quantity supplied will increase. And the reason for that, if the price in a market goes up, that is going to attract more producers, right? All of a sudden, everyone's making all this money. Entrepreneurs who are sitting on the sidelines are going to see this and say, oh yeah, we'll get into this market too. Let's go make this thing and produce it and sell it. Well, because of that, QS, quantity supplied, is also going to increase. Additionally, if we can make greater profit margins all of a sudden because prices in the market went up, we want to make and sell as many of those as we can at a higher profit margin then when the market settles down a little bit because of increased competition, the price will go back down. So, supply. 
With supply comes cost-benefit analyses, trade-offs, just like we discussed with, de uh, with demand, right? The cost is the cost of production, or what we call marginal private cost, marginal cost. Benefit is the price paid by consumers in the market. So whatever price they're receiving in return, that would be the benefit for a supplier. Now, it's kind of the same thing, right? You can see we're plotting our points. At $10, that's too cheap. There are zero producers who are willing to make this good and sell it at 10 bucks. At 20, we add one. At 30, Firm A jumps in at $30. Now, what does that tell us about Firm A, Company A? Okay, well, what it tells us is that they're willing to accept $30. That's their minimum willingness to accept. Firm A did not jump into this market until the price reached $30. Why? Because their marginal cost is $30. They're not going to make something for 30 bucks and then sell it for less than 30. That wouldn't make sense. So the same is true for firm B. Firm B doesn't come into the market until $45. They're willing to accept $45 because their marginal private cost is $45. So this company up here, let's just call this company uh, Apple. Okay, Apple is not willing to participate in this market until the price gets to 70 bucks. Why? Because their marginal cost is $70. So this supply curve also is our marginal private cost curve. It's a de derivation okay, of the marginal cost of each producer. These two are connected at the hip. So this can shift too. Okay, we might actually have uh, shifts in market supply and you can see this bubble already got a little bit ahead of itself so what happens if there is a shift in market supply well we could see it shift rightward or leftward they might produce more or they might produce less now this is caused by something other than market price we just showed I just showed you how we plot these dots on the graph according to price changes on the graph so a price increase or decrease would not shift these curves at all. I want to make that really clear. Just changing the price in this market would not shift these graphs, these, these curves. Okay, The shifts are caused by something other than market price. So it could be the price of a different good, for example. right? Let's say we use uh, steel to make this good, whatever this good is. And the cost of steel just went down because the supply of steel went up. Well, if the cost of steel goes down, right, that means that we can make more of this good using the same amount of money. We can make more of it. And the marginal private cost for each individual producer is actually decreasing. So whereas before, at $10, no one was willing to produce this good. Now, at $10, we have three firms who are willing to produce this good. So the marginal private cost must have decreased. The supply is increasing at every single price in the market. We now see more available. Why? Well, here's what could cause those. Let's just look at increases. Okay, the, if the cost of production goes down. If input costs decrease, what we're putting in to making the good, if those costs go down, supply will increase or shift right, shift rightward. Remember that. These increases are actually shifts rightward or leftward, for right now anyway. Okay, we're only shifting right and left. Technology and efficiency. If we have increased efficiency, supply will increase. If taxes are decreased, supply will increase. If subsidies are increased, the government's giving us more money, we can increase our supply. And then finally, as the number of firms enter a market, we have more suppliers, right? There are new companies supplying, so of course, supply would increase. And any of those opposites would send it moving leftward. So this is just to kind of uh, act as a reference for you. Demand increase, shift rightward, demand decrease, shift leftward, so on and so forth, and showing you how it would affect the equilibrium price and quantity. 
this is showing that to you on a graph. So you've got supply and demand in a market, right? Supply and demand. Where those two meet, the blue dot here is called the equilibrium. We can see that equilibrium up here at P1 and down here at Q1. That is the equilibrium price and quantity, the blue dot. But then we get this purple curve. There's a gray arrow shifting the supply to the right in this market. When that happens, notice we're not moving it downward or upward. It's shifting rightward. The new supply curve, which is just drawn parallel to the old one, okay, no big deal, leave it parallel, and it has the same, you know, same slope because of that, that creates this new equilibrium in the market, P2 and Q2. This is now where we are. This is the new equilibrium, okay? This is old news. This is where it's at now. So the price decreased, from the original price and the quantity increased. And what you'll notice is that we've got increase in supply, decrease in supply, increase in demand, and decrease in demand. And for each one of them, it's the same thing to start. The supply curve and the demand curve, green and, and red, with the blue equilibrium. It's the same graph. The only difference is where that purple curve ends up the new supply, the new supply, new demand, and new demand, and as a result, where the purple equilibrium is now, the new equilibrium price and quantity. So, you've got some levels to go with this stuff. I want you to put a little bit of practice into that and see if you can do it.